Hey folks, welcome to today's video. It's been a while since I've done a video. I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the things and experiences that I had uh, so far on season five of History is Alone. Um, in particular, I want to talk a little bit about my shelter. I want to talk about my fishing pole. And I want to give just a couple of tips or tricks on how to cut your snare wire without a uh, multi-tool. The History Channel actually has on YouTube, they've got a pretty good segment of how I made my shelter. And when you get dropped off into an area, you need to obviously look at the resources that you have available and then determine what type of shelter you can make out of those resources. If I had had a lot of pine or spruce, I might have done a different type of shelter. I had been practicing before I left, um, hoping to utilize those resources. But when I got dropped off, there was no uh, coniferous forest probably closer than a half a mile. Uh, we did have restrictions on the size of the trees that we were allowed to cut down and keeping you know that in mind um, when I first looked at my area I basically had to change my shelter approach to meet or to um, I just had to look at my resources and then figure out what I was going to be able to do. So in my area I had a lot of birch saplings. I had a lot of willow as well, but also a lot of birch saplings. And a shelter that I have practiced in the past is a dome type shelter. Uh, so immediately when I saw my area and saw all the birch saplings and the stands of birch saplings, I decided to make a dome type shelter. And what I did is I walked into a birch stand I found a, you know, one that was nice and flat and semi far away from the river, but then, you know, not too close. You have to weigh all these things, whether you want to, especially when time goes on, how far you want to walk to the river, how many calories that's going to take to get to your water, and also your food source there, which the river was mostly my food source. Um, so what I did is I found the birch uh, stand and I walked into it and it, this particular stand had everything that I wanted in a shelter and I cleaned out all of the birch saplings in the center of this circle and then I left some standing poles, some standing saplings around for the basic structure of my shelter and all I did is I just started doming them over, tying them together and made a dome framework. Then I took some willow branches and I wove them in and out of those living poles or living stakes there and if I needed to add a stake I would cut a sapling and I'd drive it into the ground and then I would hammer in a short stake next to that and then tie wired up and that was a pretty good pretty good structure there pretty good pole for the for part of my structure so one thing they didn't show was how I was able to cut my tie wire without using a multi-tool. And I had practiced this as well. I took several different types of snare wire. I can't even remember how many types. I took at least probably four or five different types. I took a brass type wire. I took a stainless steel wire. But then I also took just basically an iron wire. And I want to say, if I remember correctly, this is 20 gauge. That's what we were allowed to bring. We were not allowed to bring stranded snare wire. It all had to be solid. And I brought this iron tie wire. Just I'm pretty familiar with it. I use it in my job quite a bit. It's a, a bigger gauge is what I use at work. But anyway, I'm, I'm fairly familiar with this. And this for me was just going to be the almost an extension of the cordage that I brought because I brought paracord as well. So this is what I used to tie my structure together. And what I did, let me see if I can pull some of this off here. Oh, this is it's already cut right here. So what I did is I took the snare wire and when I was ready to cut it, I would kink it and I would pull it, just make a loop like that, and I'd pull it really tight. So then it kinked it right there. 
And now you have to have kind of strong fingernails, but I would put my fingernail right on the end of right where I just creased it, right where I just kinked it right there. And I'll try and get that bend exactly perfect, and then it just breaks just like that. Once again, all I did is just take my snare wire, make a loop, kink it really good, and then bring it back. And you can see, I don't know if it shows up very well on the camera, but you can see where it's been distressed right there. It actually turns a different color. You can see it's a, a little bit lighter. And then I'll just bend it back the other way using my nail. And then that time it didn't break real good because I didn't, I wasn't able to kink it exactly on that spot. But that's okay, I'll just push it back the other way. Push it back. And then it just breaks. Now if I was using my stainless steel snare wire, and if I had the resources available to me, in other words a couple of rocks, I would use this method. And all I would do is just take a rock, maybe it's got a sharp edge on it, this is going to be a fragile rock, but we'll see how it works. And I'll have a base and just hit it. Already it broke. I, mean, it, I hit it a couple times, but it just weakened the metal enough. And then now I can just bend it back and forth and it just breaks like that. It's a piece of cake. Just hit it. Just like that one time. And you can see right here where it's been damaged. And then I just break it and it comes right apart. When I was ready to make my fishing pole, I just found a nice birch. This is aspen, but I had a ton of birch to work with. And I had a nice big bow saw as well. And what I would do here is, this is, I want one approximately seven feet long or so. I would take it and I would cut it right here. Uh, this is a little thick to just always hold on to all the time. You want your fishing pole to be pretty light. Um, and the birch uh, provided the correct, um, the correct uh, flexibility or stiffness for a fishing pole for me. To make my fishing pole, all I did is harvest a birch sapling. This is actually aspen, but I had a lot of birch to work with in my area. I wanted, you know, about, oh, a little, you know, bigger than, I don't know, it's probably about 50 cent piece size down here at the base. And then I wanted one to taper uh, correctly and be, you know, nice and straight. Just something you would imagine of a very rigid fishing pole uh, to be like. I didn't need, you know, a super lightweight one. I didn't want it to have a ton of action, but I did want it to have some give. So, just a just a sapling, and uh, I had a bow saw. I had a 30-inch bow saw, so I was able to just saw it right off. It's not like I had to beaver chew with my knife. My knife edge is a, you know, was and is a resource that I didn't want to waste. If I have a saw that's designed to, even with just something small like this, it's designed to slice right through it. I would rather utilize the edge of my saw blade as opposed to my knife that I use the edge quite regularly. Uh, the knife that I have on right now is it's the same model as I, the one I took to Vancouver Island, the Genesis from LT Wright Knives, and, but the one that I took to Mongolia uh, they call it the Gen 6 which when I got back from Vancouver Island I love this knife, I love everything about it, but I wanted it to be at least another two inches longer. And that's the one that I took to Vancouver or to uh, Mongolia. So all I did with this was just start hacking some of these branches off, just to make it a little easier to work with. And then I'll clean it up after I get some of these big ones off of here. Bringing me right back to Mongolia. The bugs are horrible today. <laughs> And it's starting to get to the point where it's, you know, I wanted my branch to be as straight as I can get it. And right here it kind of starts doing a funky twist right here. So I'm just going to cut this with my saw right there. So now I've got a pretty stout pole. You can see how it tapers down here at the end to, I don't know, maybe nickel size diameter. And what I want to do now is make it smoother. I want to get rid of 
First of all, I want to get rid of the bark, just because I don't want pieces of bark falling off or doing whatever and getting in the way of the line or anything like that. Also, I want to make it as smooth as possible, because if I'm going to be holding this thing and carrying it around, I don't want it to be uncomfortable to hold uh, when I'm catching fish or sitting out there for hours trying to catch them. So the first thing I'm going to do is just start debarking it. And you can see here where I left a little nub of a limb on there. I'm going to go ahead and take that off first, see if I can't get that a little bit smoother. And it doesn't have to be perfect, but like I said, I want it almost as nice as I can get it. And now I'm going to just start debarking it and getting rid of some of this, I don't know, I'm not a real technical guy. I call them pokies because they poke me in the hand. They're little knots, they're little just rough edges on the bark. So now I've got my fishing pole debarked. And what I want to do now is just kind of look and see if there's a natural angle or a natural way that it tends to, to bend. And if I do that, it will help me not have to worry about pieces like this branch right here. I don't have to really clean that up too much. So you can see it's kind of burning or bending rather to my left. And also this bow right here will if I put the eyelets up here pointing towards the bow, it's going to keep the line away from my fishing pole. I don't want anything, like if I were to put eyelets right here, it could potentially hang up right here on this knot. So I want to utilize the natural bend of it. And I can see right here there's a little bit of a knot that needs to be cleaned up a little bit. So I'm going to go ahead and do that now. Now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to create some notches of where I think I want my eyelets. And then the notches, they're just going to be circular notches around this. What that'll help do is help the tie wire or snare wire from sliding up and down. Now as this dries up, it will of course shrink and I will need to re-tighten the tie wire eyelets. So I'm just going to go, I'm not going to do anything too crazy. I'm just going to make a circular cut around here. All I've done here is just made a simple notch all the way around this. And that's just, like I said, going to be a spot for the tie wire to rest. So now I'm going to continue to do that about every maybe foot and a half or so. I only need about five or six. Alright, so now I'm done with my notches. I've got one, so here's the end. This will probably be right where my handle is, where I'm going to do one more thing to it. But there's a notch. There's one. There's one and then all the way at the end. Then, as I took some of my iron wire and just tried to estimate because once again this is a resource. I don't want to use any more of it than I absolutely have to but I do want to not skimp and make it hard on myself. I'm going to make an eyelet uh, let's see here I'm going to make an eyelet Approximately that diameter right there, which I want to say that's about nickel size. Right there. And I'm going to cut it so that both these tag ends are about the same length. Now I've got my eyelet approximately the size that I want. I'm going to try to make it a nice circle. And I'm going to once again figure out the direction that I want the eyelet to face, which is going to be this way. I'm going to put that on there, on the stick. I'm trying to make a nice, tight twist pattern. The stick is really bendy, or really warped, kind of. It really wants to move all over the place, but... I'm going to get it just as tight as I can. 
and then I'm going to start to twist it. Just like that. I used a little bit more tie wire on this one than I needed. I've got a couple of big tag ends that basically I would just wrap around to undo it. But you can see what I meant by that, which wasn't a great explanation. I can just wrap these. I'm going to leave it for right now, but I could just wrap them around so that they're out of the way of the line. But you can see how there's a little bit of a gap between this, the cross piece of my eyelet and the wood. So I'm going to take and twist this part as well. A couple of good twists on there. There, there's one eyelet right now. Here I have my fishing pole with the eyelets on it. I've got one, two, three, four, five. So, after I did that, what I wanted to do is create a space for a reel on this. And I'm going to measure this stick up. This is just one of the branches I cut off of this aspen. I'm going to measure this up against the base of my fishing pole, approximately where I want to hold it, just kind of get a feel of it, feel where I want the reel. And then trim it down to size. And then lash it to this pole here. And I'll probably even make a little bit of a notch right here on the bigger stick just to accept this smaller stick a little bit better. So I'm thinking I want it about there. And this is one of the sections of line that I brought with me. I believe we were allowed 300 yards and I think I brought three 100 yard spools just so that I would have one as a reel and then the other ones as backups. Uh, you know, I could peel off some of that and make some uh, fishing snares or fishing triggers. But if you notice, this particular spool has little notches in it. And I was hoping that I could just stick my finger in here and use that as a reel. It turned out that didn't work as good as if uh, so once I hooked a fish, I would pull the reel off of this handle that I'm going to make, and then I would just pull it in like a hand line. It just seemed to work better that way. Uh, the reel, the reel thing just didn't work out so well, but it was a good spot to hold to hold my spool of line. So this is basically what I'm after. This stick here is going to hold the reel in place. I just did a basic little notch there, even made it a little too big, whatever. But it'll help hold that in place so it doesn't slide up and down. Now I'm just going to wrap alternately with tie wire around here to secure it. And that's about all I need. Now I left a little tag end here, 
all I'm going to do is try and twist those together. Just like that. Then I'll do this twist a little bit better, but first I'm going to cut it about right there. I've left these here. I can twist that. Now I can lay these, I can pinch them together, lay them down flat. I'll even probably take a rock and maybe beat this out of the way. Really what I should have done is made sure that that twist was out of the way of the reel, but I still think it'll be just fine. So you can see that I've got this line all over the place here. But you can see, I put that over the top, and then I can use my finger as a winder. Now I can tell already it's a little too long, so I'll just go ahead and nip this end off right here. Yeah, that's a lot better. Now the stick doesn't really get in the way of my finger. I do want a little bit of travel for this spool to move this way and this way, but it spins just fine. All right guys, well that's how I made my fishing pole on alone. Um, nothing too major, but it was something that I had thought about before I launched. Uh, thought of a way to make a good fishing pole. This way now, I don't just have um, like a cane pole or a uh, like what some folks use as a crappie pole, where I have to tie maybe six, seven, eight feet of line onto here and rely on only that distance. Now I can take this line and create and make it just like a, uh, a casting rod. I can put some tie wire on the end of the line somewhere above the bait and use it for a weight if I want to. Otherwise, I can just take it and spool it off in the river and let the current take it down. And yeah. I thought it was pretty cool. Well, one other thing I thought I'd address, and that is the amount of outbursts that I have on this season. I definitely had my share on season two, but it looks like I've had quite a few more on, on this time. Um, I don't really know what to say about that, except um, I filmed it, it happened. Um, they chose to edit that in, um, it makes for good TV. If you follow my channel at all, very rarely will I have an episode like that, only if I get extremely frustrated, like if I'm doing a friction fire set or, or something like that. But it was, I was by myself. I didn't care. Even though I had the camera rolling, um, I talked to the camera nonstop. It was, you, you're filming for hours and hours and hours, and pretty soon you forget the camera's even on sometimes, especially if I'm doing a project like this and I just get done talking or, or if I'm even as basic as starting a fire and waiting for it to, to coal up or catch so that I could cook some uh, fish or boil water. Uh, this last episode, I don't remember what episode it is, maybe six or something, I, I got really mad at the wind and I said, just calm the F down. Well, the backstory to that is Mongolia was very, very dry. A forest fire had come through my area, I don't know, 20, 30 years earlier, and just totally wiped out the tree population. The only thing left were some uh, uh, saplings, birch saplings. But it let, uh, there was also a ton of basically waist-high or at least knee-high dead grass. Well, if you've ever made fires before or if you know anything about fire, you know that dead grass burns quite readily. You notice all of us have a pit for our fire pit, uh, for our fireplace. Uh, that's for fire prevention so that we don't catch all of Mongolia on fire. So I had just made a nice fire. Uh, all my fires basically, except for very few, were quite small. Just enough to boil water or cook fish and then put the thing out. And then when that wind picked up, I was scared to death it was going to carry an ember over to the nearby field. I was a little ways away from it, but still not far enough away to be safe. So I had to really watch my fire and that wind kicked up and I was just scared to death I was going to torch all of Mongolia. And it was just, I was like, man, you're throwing this wind at me. You're throwing all these different things at me. And the weather there is crazy. I mean, we, we definitely have some, some extremes here in Minnesota. But Mongolia, it was just, 
it would be nice and then all of a sudden the wind would kicked up, kick up and then it would you know, spit rain or do whatever and then it would die out and then the wind would come up. I mean it was just this cycle of, of gales that would, that would come through and you know, you're out there, you're, you're hungry, uh, you're, you're surviving the best you can. I had the mice once again. I guess nobody else seems to, to mine mice in their, in, their, in their beds, or at least the edit didn't show any of that. But it was, it was, parts of it were extremely frustrating. Parts of it were extremely rewarding. And actually, most of it was extremely rewarding. What they decide to show is up to them. I filmed it all, so I can't complain, you know, because I gave them that footage. But on the other hand, if you follow my YouTube channel, you'll see I'm a lot more calm than that. And uh, it's funny, uh, those of you who know George Wells Jr., he was laughing. He said that he really watched his language and was really careful the first time that we met and hung out because I am not normally like that. I don't freak out in front of people, but if I'm in the woods and I've got mice in my bed and the wind kicks up and threatening to burn all of Mongolia down, yeah, I'm going to get a little upset. So whatever, enough about that, I guess. Uh, if anybody has any questions, feel free to put them in the comments. Uh, I didn't want to make this video extremely long, so I haven't included my fishnet quite yet. Um, I may do a video later on about that. I have done netting videos in the past, but anyway, that net was pretty cool. I thought it uh, occupied my time for quite some time. It took a long time to make that net. I wanted to make sure the squares were nice and small. Some of the, some of the uh, grayling that I was catching were, were quite small. Um, I don't know, the smallest one I probably caught was four or five inches long. So I wanted to make sure that the, that the squares in the net weren't too big. So that the smaller your squares, the longer it takes. So anyway, like I said, any questions, put them in the comments. I'll try to answer them as best I can. All right, guys, hope you liked the video. Take care.